Hey, Paul. Uh, uh, very happy to um, have you on um, Geek Vibes Nation to talk about Mamba. And um, here it is right there. And um, oh, what can I say? One of the most exciting things I've ever seen. <laughs> Literally. Um, yeah, it, it's incredible. I So I had not even heard of this film. And I know that's... Um, basically for a lot of people. So now, um, before we get into kind of like um, the the history of finding the film, um, can you give us like a brief history of the film itself and kind of how it became sort of um, lost or like partially lost? Well, Mamba was a small film company that worked within Metro Pictures in the early 20s. And um, the, it was primarily a, a film production house for the actress May Murray and there's a fairly famous film called Jazzmania which your listeners could look up on the internet movie database or just google Jazzmania 1922 and the other one um, there's another film that she made she remade it in 1930 uh, called Peacock Alley and so both of those were famous silent films starring May Murray made by Tiffany and they released their films through Metro Metro Film Corporation. And when Metro and Goldwyn and Mayer combined, they didn't want all three cast crews and everyone who they had on their books. So they got rid of probably 100 people off the bottom of the cast and crew, um, uh, their staff. And the people who, the Tiffany part, separated from MGM and revived itself with Robert Z. Leonard, who was May Murray's husband. Robert Z. Leonard became a very popular director at MGM. So he stayed, he went between making May Murray films for Tiffany itself and directing for MGM. He directed things like A Day at the Races or some Marx Brothers films, quite a number of films in the 30s and 40s after he and May Murray separated. But the 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 essential piece of information is that Tiffany decided to be known as the the other MGM, and so they were they can because they were a derivative of what MGM formed. They decided they were going to be just as good as MGM, but on perhaps a B movie basis. But their main interest was to provide cinemas with color material. And they made a lot of colour shorts in the 1920s and the main thing that they looked at doing was to supplement programs so when Warner Brothers formed and then Columbia got going this period of 1923, 24, 25 when the film companies really uh, formed themselves in a major way Tiffany was sort of orbiting around that saying uh, me too, me too we're here too, we're just as good as MGM and we're rising like Warners and we're consolidating, um, say, like Columbia and we're rising just the same way Fox are. And they took a great interest in sound and colour. That was their main thing and they made a lot of shorts, as I said, uh, in colour and then starting in about 1928 with sound. And they saw what Warner Brothers did with sound. They thought, let's do it with colour. Let's make an all-colour, all-sound movie in 1929. That will springboard us out of what was considered B-movie or ancillary movie status. And that will we'll, we will enjoy what Warner Brothers will enjoy with colour, what Warner Brothers have enjoyed with sound. What they didn't count on was that the majors ganged up on them uh, and it was all over Mamba. Mamba was such a, a hit, March 1930, it was released in New York and I'm in Australia and it was released in July 1930 in Australia. So they got their films out internationally fairly quickly and they chose Mamba as a topic because it was an international story. It wasn't going to look just American and it was going to look very European and the rise of colour and talkies, especially across Europe. And people don't realise how big the Asian market is. It's about number three or four in the world, yet there's only 25 million people here. So it's a huge market per, per capita per head. 
So Mamba was really uh, set everybody back on their heels. And th that was one of the reasons why immediately they were were blocked from the big chain cinemas. So the, the, the Metro had cinemas, RKO had the Orpheum circuit, which they wired and instantly gave them a circuit of movie palaces. They just, vo they, they wired vaudeville theatres. And so they became the first major picture palaces that were converted into sound. So am I rambling? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so, and, and, and what was interesting is um, the movie was, um, a hit, right? It did actually make yes. um, a good bit of money. Yes, it cost five hundred thousand to make, and that's a huge amount of money when films were being made for twenty, thirty, or and even eighty thousand, even by the majors. So it's an outdoor, all color, talky in Technicolor. Now every other every other Technicolor film of nineteen twenty nine is an indoor movie. They're all musicals with people clomping around on stage <laughs> as though you couldn't go to Broadway, so Broadway came to you. So it wasn't until perhaps follow through the Paramount golfing comedy of nineteen thirty did um, did movies uh, did sound and Technicolor move outside. Now Mamba had. Uh, four or six of the available, I think, 10 or 12 Technicolor films. Now, I think one of the reasons why it costs so much, or they're willing to spend so much, was because they they overpaid on hiring the cameras. So if Paramount or Metro or Fox were making an experimental outdoor movie, all the cameras went to Tiffany for a month because Tiffany paid so much money to secure them. That's part of the reason why the film cost so much. It was made on the Universal back lot and the same back lot was used immediately by Warner Brothers for a really atrocious musical, all in colour, all out tours called Golden Dawn, which was a sort of like a cannibal the musical is the only way to describe it. Dawn <laughs> being someone's daughter, believe it. So Golden <laughs> Dawn wasn't the sunrise. Golden Dawn was that blonde haired girl over there you know, <laughs> in the next hut. But Mamba is a drama, and it's a really nasty film. With Brian Trenchard Smith, who is a, one of England and Australia's greatest B movie directors, I don't know whether you know the man from Hong Kong or oh yeah, some of, um, or yeah. We actually, we actually had Brian on our. Um, um, so I have two shows. I have the Video Attic, and I also have a like genre um, show. Oh, good. And we had him on as a, a very special guest. So he's really wonderful, awesome. isn't he? Well, oh, yeah. he's written a fabulous piece called Mamba, the first gory talkie. So <laughs> the world's first gory talkie. And he's absolutely right. The movie starts off in the most outrageous fashion where uh, Augusto Bolte, who's this awful German sort of uh, landowner, it's set in East Africa. It's set between the, the German uh, fort and the English fort. And there's a village. And August Bolte, this German, absolutely, look, he's called Mamba because of the snake. They represent him as a, a snake in the grass. And he arrives in a rickshaw, right? And a woman runs out with a naked baby holding it by the leg, saying, my baby, your baby, no food, hungry, hungry. He says, ah, get away, and pushes her down a row of, flight of stairs with a baby in a hand and you think right we're off to a start here <laughs> and it cuts to a german soldier and an english soldier statesman soldiers saying to us saying that bolt hey, he'll be the death of us with these natives why doesn't he treat everyone properly and of course bolt hey walks up to them to go into the canteen with them and they say quick let's go inside nobody wants to talk to bolt hey. he's such a pig and uh, there's another scene where two British soldiers are talking and there's uh, African children fighting each other with swords, one of which is Stymie out of the Our Gang series. Mm. So, if you know, I, Our Gang Kids, he's in that. He's got a gourd on his head as a helmet, you know, like a pumpkin gourd, dried gourd. Anyway, uh, one English soldier says to the other, um, Stop fighting, children. You'll never see us Germans and us British fight like that. You don't <laughs> need to fight like that. And, and the German guy says to him in German, he says, yes, that's true, shithead. 
<laughs> in Germany says that. So it's it's a it's the movie, of course, is pre-code. It has no hesitation in being vulgar and crude. Anyway, Bolte decides the only way he's going to get uh, attention and affection from the Germans and the British is to buy himself a bride. So he sends off, a, he, he goes through a catalogue. There's a scene in the film where he's coming through photographs, yeah. all these lewd photographs of women like this and like this and like this. <laughs> and he says, oh, that one, she, she's the one I want. And he picks out this this brides for sale catalogue and they turn out to be daughters of impoverished German um, businessmen who are offering their daughters for sale to people like him to pay off their debts. This is in real too. So he picks one out, goes to uh, goes to Germany, and of course marries this absolutely horrified girl. Who there's a very funny wedding scene where the bridesmaids meet him for the first time, and he bursts through the door saying, "Hello, everyone, it's me!" Like this, and they all go, oh, no, "Don't tell me you're going to be marrying this creature." It's very very funny. They end up on a ship on their honeymoon and she won't go near the bed, right? So there's a censored sequence in the film, but we've got the soundtrack to it, where he basically just attacks her and starts yeah. pulling her clothes off, groping her like this. And she runs out onto the deck, she's crying her eyes out, and she meets this handsome young soldier who um, who is happening to who just happens to be going to the very same place in East Africa. It's a place called Nyposen. And that's where that's where Bolte's uh, home is. That's where the two forts are. And that's where the natives who will soon be revolting. Uh, so they all clash in the middle of that. There's a big wedding feast. Everything goes wrong, you can imagine. And then the natives attack him. So it's pretty good stuff. There's yeah. very clear imagery that went into Gone with the Wind. There's mm -hmm. very clear imagery of the Africa that, that you could see the African Queen. There's very clear imagery that you can see uh, Zulu. So really, this is 1929. This film was made September, uh, October, November 1929 on the Universal Backlot, but it is 10 years before Gone with the Wind, and it's 15, 15 what is it? 25 years before the African Queen, and 35 years before Zulu. So it's a very prescient film. The imagery in it, when the natives go berserk, there's a lot of them. It's not like there's 15 natives running around a tree. They're like there's 200 people on the set. Everything's on fire. Have a look at the last 10 minutes of the film. Yeah. It bursts into a major, major set piece. And, of course, there's this huge fort that they're all climbing over and belting each other and stabbing each other. It's pretty nasty stuff. Oh, it is. it is, And it's very impressive. Like, I can certainly... You know, you can see like uh, the inspiration for like Indiana Jones, even like yes, um, yes, um, yeah. So um, now, um, how uh, did you first come about like um, searching for and 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 ultimately finding Mamba? Now I'm friends with Janus Norden. He calls himself the Talking King, and he's in Stockholm in Sweden, and he's a gramophone sound engineer. He's a sound engineer, but his special spe speciality is in gramophone recordings of the uh, dawn of sound. So I, in 2006, I'd become friends with the uh, the Swedish ambassador to Australia, and I, I'd been part of a uh, importation of a Swedish film festival, and it had been very, very successful. And I, she said it was a female, the ambassador, and she said, uh, why don't you go to Sweden and investigate vintage Swedish films and blah, blah, blah. And Janice and I had, had contacted each other on the internet about vintage Swedish films. And when we both realised we had a, a, an exact interest in gramophone, technicolour gramophone talkies, um, he said, there's one film that nobody's ever found. It's called Mamba. And if you can ever find it, that's like the holy grail of Technicolor Talkies because it was made by a defunct film company that was pushed out of business by 1932. And their whole library of films, along with all of the smaller studios of the time, like Invincible, Chesterfield, um, various other early talkie outfits that all folded 
by 1934 or consolidated like Monogram did into Republic by 1935. Everything pre-1935 that was an independent studio was used in the fire for the burning of Atlanta in 1938. So in order to create such a monstrous fire and they, uh, Selznick Studio said, whatever you want to clear out from your, from your, uh, your vaults that you're never going to use again. And of course, gramophone talkies, you know, sound on, sound on disc talkies, mute prints, silent prints, everything was burned that night against the King Kong gates because they didn't want that set used anymore because studios were hiring the King Kong gates and making Tarzan films with them. And so they decided after 1930, they sort of put a, a, a line in the sand saying, pre line in the calendar, um, saying pre-1935 material is all going up in smoke. Let's get rid of it all. We're all sounders, sounders now perfected. Movies are snazzy. And those smaller film companies had morphed together to become Republic Pictures or they went out of business. And everything of Tiffany's that was in Hollywood was burned. And that's why the film company disappeared and their films disappeared. But because they were so innovative in the 20s and they had a fairly good distribution internationally um, through, say, Great Britain, whatever was in Great Britain or across Europe, or of course, they immediately sent things to Australia. That's why we ended up in Australia with a print of Mamba that played the movie palaces and did extremely well. And it ended up in Adelaide in South Australia. So if you look at a map of the world and then see where the equator is and keep looking further south, you'll <laughs> find Australia. And if you look right at the bottom of Australia, you'll find Adelaide. Um, and then you'll find the South Pole. So <laughs> what was in Adelaide was a, a an independent family-run distribution um, uh, office, and they handled all of these independent films. So Fox and Metro and Paramount and RKO all had a film exchange in every city, and there was an independent film exchange which handled all the other stuff. Well, among all the other stuff was all the Tiffany Library, the Monogram Library, the Invincible Library, films like that. So we ended up with all of these prints from these film companies that never had, that didn't have, they were orphaned in Australia, in the desert, lost in the desert. They were. <laughs> um, and then they'd get hired out to what was known as the Picture Show Men. And the Picture Show Men had a truck and they had a screen on the side of the truck and a projector in the back of the truck. And they went around the all the, the dusty towns around Australia showing movies. There's actually a Rod Taylor, John Mellion comedy called The Picture Show Man made in Australia in 19... 77 so maybe uh viewers can look that up on the internet movie database uh or just google it google trailer youtube the picture show man and you'll get a, a clear image of the type of traveling picture show people that we had in australia all of whom would show mamba but the print was technicolor and it was mute and it had the discs so care was taken and because it was such an interesting film and you could show it in native like in the indigenous towns you could show it because it was a pure action film it wasn't a, it wasn't so much a like a marx brothers comedy or something like that or something sophisticated from mgm it's a flat out action epic and it was in color it had a pretty good life but it ended up in adelaide and in the 1950s Television came to Australia in 1956, 57. And when it came, it was uh, overnight, everybody bought a television. It wasn't like in America, where it was a slow graduation across the population from 1948 through to 55. It hit bang right on September 1956, because the Melbourne Olympics happened. So everybody bought a new telly for the, to watch the Olympics on. Or you went down the street and stood in front of a television uh, showroom where they had TVs in the window and there'd be clusters of 30 or 40 people in the street all watching television. What they weren't doing was going to the movies. So the industry absolutely collapsed in Australia in 1958. And as a result, these uh, 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 exchanges culled nine out of 10 prints. 
And so we lost all these beautiful MGM Technicolor prints as well. Everything got culled, got this chopped up, and then Republic closed, and then RKO closed. So we went down. So of every hundred prints, only ten survived. And of this um, independent film exchange, they just closed up shop because there was no market for their B grade product or for their 1930s and 40s films that could stay in circulation on a flat rate basis. So this old couple or this couple like Bonnie and Clyde, they, their names were Murray and Pat Matthews and Murray worked for Hoyt's Theatres and the word would go around, hey Murray, they're going to destroy blah blah blah. Well Murray and Pat would get the truck out and go down to the film exchange and they'd say, load all those films you're going to destroy wow. into the back of our truck and took them home. And that's where they lived for the next 50 and 60 years. That's it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's incredible. So, I mean, they basically like saved all those films um, that they were just going to have. Yeah, hundreds of prints. And nitrate, a lot of nitrate. Now, the sad thing is that uh, Pat just died last weekend. She was 90 and Murray is about to die this week. So it's an extremely sad situation that these great people are leaving us. You can't believe it. The very week that Mamba comes out on DVD. So oh, their legacy yeah. to the world is that DVD you're holding it in your hand. So well, a lot of people haven't like heard of the film, um, you know, um, they are definitely in for a treat like um it's really you would definitely also consider it like a one of a kind um yes yes just well it's uh, so one of a kind they didn't remake it until oh you know what it's a re what was it was remade the charlton heston film with all the ants in it what's that film called made about 1950 and um, it's um, it's the naked something the naked not the naked prey whatever it's called, but there's a Charlton Heston film um, and I think it might be Ann Baxter or someone like that and all these ants come across. He's a landowner in Africa. He imports a bride. Uh, she doesn't like him and then instead of, in Mamba, the natives revolt because World War I breaks out, but in this Paramount film of the 50s, um, there's an invasion of fire ants that eat all the countryside and they have to escape from them. And that's the closest I've seen to a remake of Mamba, apart from the obvious scenes that look like the African Queen, the obvious scenes that look like Zulu. Um, the, there's one scene in, in Mamba at the end with the fort. Now, if you, there's a terrific Republic Pictures serial called Undersea Kingdom made in 1936 and they used the same fort so that fort that was built at universal uh for mm -hmm. mamba okay it's recycled into forts uh, this fort in um, undersea kingdom mm -hmm. so i managed to pick that one out leonard morton's <laughs> wife alice picked out the the universal mountain is seen in the background so therefore it was shot nice. when we showed it at i think it was city fest in 2012 and as i said um, on another interview, people didn't talk to us when we went to Cinefest. Jonas and I paid our own way, by the way. You get invited, but they don't pay for you. You've got to pay for it yourself. So we flew across the planet to get to Syracuse, New York. Um, we were really welcomed there when we arrived, and then not one person talked to us for three days. And we, we were like, well, if you thought we'd go up to tables and they'd all be talking to themselves, but no one would turn around and say, hello, welcome. There's nothing. <laughs> and when we showed the film, it was because they didn't believe the film was real because no one had ever seen anything of it and no one believed that it was in colour. No one believed we had the whole thing. And Jonas had put the soundtracks back together because we managed to get a CD of the disc, of all the discs from... Todd Weiner at UCLA. He, they had a set of discs. We had the film, and he, t Todd, transposed the uh, the gramophone discs onto a CD. That ran at one speed. The CD ran at another speed. The film ran at another speed. It was a hell of a job to stitch the correct word into the correct mouth so that it wasn't out of synchronization. Mm. 
And Jonas spent about six months doing that. And he, he and his wife had just had a baby. So he was on the midnight to dawn shift. So he was sitting in the sunroom in his underpants with his laptop with a baby in a cradle, stitching the dialogue from Mamba back together. <laughs> Honestly, he did about $200,000 worth of work just wow. on the soundtrack. And then once that was put together, we had a C, we had a DVD of the original scratched but beautiful Technicolor print with the dialogue coming out of everybody's mouth as it should. So that was the first time it was synchronised in 80 years. Wow. And we and then I met Ron Hutchinson from the Vitaphone Project and he arranged for us to show it at Cinefest in upstate New York and that was the first American screening, screening since about 1931. That's incredible. Um... And people, people screamed. They, they, when it started, and it was in colour, and, you know, boom, 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 and there's a tracking shot at the start of the film that runs two and a half minutes outdoors, and it get, you go through the whole native uh, village in one long, sinuous shot. Now, again, completely innovative filmmaking, and it had certain key sound pieces in it so that if you are in a projection box and you were showing it with the talkie, the Tiffany talkie disc, you could get the sound, you could speed up or slow down the projector in order to get the sound synchronised with the disc. So everything about the, the start of that film is an innovative piece of marvellous technical uh, advancement. And I think that's why Tiffany paid so much money to secure the cameras and to secure the sound. They overspent making sure that they had all that... And I think they also got the technicians because they said we're filming outdoors in colour and sound. And that hadn't been attempted by September 1929. The amazing effort for that little film company. And then because of it, they were punished. They were absolutely locked out of the exhibition majors. They couldn't get their films into the key cinemas. And as a result, their income dropped. And there's a film called uh, The Death Kiss, made in 32 just as Tiffany were closing. And you actually get a very clear tour of the Tiffany studio. It's a murder mystery set in a film studio. It's called The, the Death Kiss. So try and find, that's been restored, as has uh, Drums of Jeopardy. And one of the things that Tiffany always did in their film, Peacock Alley is the same, they always had extremely good sound and, in, and they had extremely lavish sequences, usually a big dinner party, and in every one of those other films I just mentioned, there's a giant table, everybody's dressed to the nines, there's a monster chandelier and very snazzy furniture. So they were showing off the studio fixtures, fittings and hardware and costumes. They were advertising themselves to the cinemas so that the cinemas felt they had MGM style films that didn't come from MGM. Mm. So they had a fascinating story behind um, the way they presented themselves. Peacock Alley has some of the most beautiful furniture you've ever seen in all your life. And when Tiffany closed, their studio became the go-to studio to rent all the groovy props and costumes. So while they stopped making films, they stayed in business with small independents who would hire their, their facilities. It's a, it's a really great story. They only existed for about in that way for about 13 years. And as I said, they were burnt at the stake in order for, for uh, Rhett Butler to save Scarlett O'Hara from the burning of Atlanta. <laughs> so the burning of Atlanta took out all the fixtures and fittings of Tiffany and all the smaller studios and all their films. That's why they say, you know, we've only got 10% of all the silent movies and while we've only got maybe 25% of all the early talkies from 28 through to 35 is because they burnt them all for Gone with Wind. Now, um, to wrap up, kind of speaking of like um, lost films, is what is the holy grail for you as far as like lot finding uh, like a certain lost film? Well, been there, done that. <laughs> 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 there is no look that's it you know I, I i would love to find a very good um technicolor copy of uh a walter wanger wanger film i can't pronounce his name walter wanger um called vogues of 1938 that was re released through uh united artists there was in that period remember there was um nothing sacred a star is born becky sharp 
the dancing pirate in the first of the three strip technicolor ones but vogues of 1938 there's never been a good print of it um and it was it's on it would have been on nitrate as people don't realize that it wasn't the silver screen that we had it was the silver film prints that we had the the nitrate prints had a lot of silver in them which made them sparkle on the screen we don't we've never seen them we don't realize how breathtaking nitrate technicolor and nitrate black and white was so when they say oh the silver screen there was no such thing as the silver screen it was the print that had silver in it and they used to destroy the prints in order to get the silver back out of them you often hear that from guys who worked in film exchanges they'd say oh we're the, we're, 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 just, we're burning these prints and what's left is a cup full of silver. Hmm. So technica, early Technicolor on nitrate, um, off those silver nitrate prints are, the, are in general the ones that I'm personally interested in. Things like Lady in the Dark, there was a screening of the nitrate print of Lady in the Dark from 1944, Ginger Rogers film, made it paramount. And I almost got on a plane and travelled 12,000 kilometres across the Pacific just to see that. Hmm. So uh, what's in Australia, there's a lot in private collections in Australia, a lot. Yeah, and that's that's really interesting. And again, um, you know, um, just wanted to also um, say that this is out now and amazing um, much. The back, show um, the back cover, please. Oh, yep. All right. See that? Yeah, that, well, look at the, see the top photo of the fort? Mm-hmm. That's, you know, that's a, it's, it's a triple composition, that. Yeah, that's but, incredible. Like, it's, it's, um, so let me close up a little bit of. It's all shiny. You can't see it. Oh. Mm, we use that shot. Because you've got an actual photo, you've got a model, and then you've got a the model suspended over, you know how they used to put it on a sheet of glass and then film through it. So it's an early composition shot in Technicolor with sound. So it's absolutely the film is so innovative in its technique, and and that's why I believe that it attracted the craftsmen for the money. That's that's part of it. And John Stahl, who was the head producer at Tiffany at the time in 28, 29. He's the John Stahl who left and went to Fox when Fox formed in 34, when 20th Century Pictures met, uh, merged with Fox in 34. And he made Leave Her to Heaven, the great, um, mm. the great film, the great noir colour film. So every you can see the legacy of Tiffany in that film in itself that you would someone like John Stahl who really got on his feet at Tiffany making Technicolor shorts and then going and Mamba put it all into Leave Her to Heaven in, in with Gene Tierney in 1944 and of course a dozen other films but they were very very innovative studio because they were they went to you know they, they came through the MGM um, Minsa and out the other side and decided that they were going to make really spectacular films. But have a look at Drums of Jeopardy, The Death Kiss and um, Peacock Alley. And you'll see extraordinary, lab oh, the, the Lost Zeppelin is another one. Extraordinary mm. special effects in that film. Very noisy soundtrack because they've got the Zeppelin noise going all the time. But the, the visuals, the lavish furniture, big sets, um, really you just think wow this is this this is sort of a small film that bursts into being a big film and then becomes an innovative film and then you know it is it is whatever it's about may murray is in um peacock alley and she's she's not very good um <laughs> but the it's the film that's fascinating to watch and the fact that the soundtrack is such high quality yeah and again it's um an incredible movie and um definitely urge all the viewers to check it out um there's the cover and it is um i will link a description to uh where you can get a copy and um thank you so much for um taking the time to chat with us right. about your amazing work and um well you know what your office and your your viewers can help us with we're offering the Vista Theatre, Quentin Tarantino has bought the Vista Theatre in Los Angeles. 
and Brian Trenchard Smith and myself are willing to travel to, Brian lives in Canada, willing to travel to Los Angeles if we can get Tarantino to present Mamba as the first gory talkie uh, on a special season at the Vista on 35 mil. And I can coordinate that with Todd Weiner. Um, they've got 35 mil, three 35 mil prints of Mamba at UCLA uh, at the um, Packard Institute where they made the film. And I'm willing to come across the Pacific. Brian's willing to come from Canada if we can get the the new Vista in uh, Los Angeles, as run by Tarantino. Um, there's a woman called, uh, I think her name's Bev. I think, no, Julie. Her name's Julie, who was programming the new Beverly, who I think is programming uh, the Vista as well. But we're very keen to showcase Mamba on 35 mil. If Mr. QT and Brian and I can do a showcase presentation on 35 mil. That would be amazing. Well, let's spread the word. Let's get it out there. Let's make yeah. it happen. Well, if people ring up the, the Vista, if they phone the Vista or the new Beverly and say, I hear members available on 35 mil, you know, can, can you schedule some screenings? We'll find out about it and we'll pay our own airfare and come there ourselves. <laughs> but Brian and I are very keen to do it. So even if just he and I do it, but it'd be something that I would think Tarantino would be absolutely startled to see because it's the sort of film he would have made in 1929 had he been making Technicolor films at the time. Oh, yeah. I could definitely see this being very much in his wheelhouse. So, yeah, well, like, I will definitely um, urge everybody checking out this video to, you know, contact the Vista, tell them you want Mamba, you want it screened. Um and we'll do vaudeville. There you go. <laughs> Aussie, Aussie and Canadian vaudeville. Can you imagine that at the at the new Vista? I'll send you a clip we made of uh, as if Mamba was screening at the new Vista. We actually did a promo piece for them showing Mamba on the marquee and the crowd standing outside. It's a clip. It's not a photo. It actually moves. Oh, so nice. we've got we've got that to work with that maybe you could work with and send that out saying look how good it looks outside wait till you see it inside there you go <laughs> all right <laughs> <laughs> wonderful thanks michael